Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hadzakis Dimitris, and I uh, will present to you our review uh, with the name of Deep Learning Methods for Tumor Segmentation and Detection in X-ray Breast Imaging. Let's start with uh, why did we tackle the problem of cancer? Well, it has a psychological impact uh, concerning all the patient's uh, stress and anxiety it creates. It has a humanitarian aspect regarding uh, the loss of life and uh, high economic importance because each patient has to undergo a lot of uh, procedures, uh, surgeries, chemotherapies, radiations, and other diagnostic uh, uh, examinations. And uh, lastly, in some cases, such as our case, we have large data sets depending on the type of the cancer. And we chose deep learning because it's the best known technique for image detection and classification, and it's also constantly improving. Breast cancer uh, is the most common form of cancer found in women, and mammography is considered the best method to diagnose it early and thus mitigate sur uh, survival rates. Uh, it has found it reduces mortality around 35% in women aged 50 to 69 years of age. And it uh, occurs in the ducts and lobules of the breast as shown in the picture. Mammograms are as depicted below, and this shows uh, pictures of breasts with increasing density. It's, it's not worthy that uh, extreme dense breasts and the denser the breast is, it's usually more difficult to diagnose uh, a tumor. The lesions that occur are masses, tumors actually, yeah. Uh, they can be circumscribed, well-defined, uh, or uh, indistinct, which are ill-defined, or speculated as can be seen here. Then there's classifications. We can be benign, usually happening, uh, occurring in the skin, suspicious if they're amorphous or they're very heterogeneous, and they indicate a high probability of malignance. Here are some cases. CAD now, computer as aided diagnosis, is something that is employed nowadays a lot due to its main advantages of uh, it's automation of the diagnostic process of making hopefully less mistakes than humans uh, nowadays in some aspect in certain areas in the future uh, hopefully more. It's CAD, yeah. So, uh, CAD. Uh, the advantages of uh, CAD is, uh, as I said, the automation of the diagnostic process, the fact that it can make less mistakes in certain cases and hopefully even less in the future. Uh, it processes fast large amounts of data and compl complex data. And the main, uh, the main aim of the project is to create earlier detection and thus better prognosis. Areas of application include diabetic retinopathy, breast cancer, non-polypoid lesions in CT colonography, and brain of MRI for psychiatric disease classification. Major hurdles uh, include the lack of high quality curated uh, datasets and subpar performance of some of the existing algorithms. Now, in this review, what we did was search through the archive database of papers with the keywords deep learning and neural networks, along with the keywords mammogram and breast. And this resulted in more than 350 papers. Of these papers, due to some accuracy filter, which was accuracy below 8% and the area under curve below 85%, all those papers were dropped. Also, relevance was an issue because a lot of these papers didn't contain exactly neural networks, so we dropped those as well. And lastly, we had several papers of whose architecture was very similar. And this way, we kept uh, only the ones that had the best results. Of those seven, uh, in order to accommodate the time frame and the length of uh, the project, we uh, arrived on the four most important ones due to their high accuracy or certain types of innovation. The first uh, example uh, has included in the extreme learning machine. How it starts is that you have a mammogram, you extract a region of interest, and you parse it through a dual tree complex wavelet transformation, which is basically a transformation of uh, like a Fourier transform, but instead of cosines and sines, it's, uh, it's a more complex mathematical uh, feature. Then it's parsed through a hidden Markov tree, which basically uh, penalizes all coefficients that are not sequentially the same, like uh, if the uh, coefficient is large, the triplet 
of coefficients around it must be also large uh, to be augmented. And if they're not, it's the, the triplet is penalized. Then it's passed to a genetic algorithm, which is a sequential uh, uh, sequence of data. And a crossover point is selected on the data, on, on that data. And then these uh, two pairs of data are mixed and matched, like uh, chromosomes. And we create two offsprings, which are different. These two offsprings uh, also have a chance to have random mutations in order to create some randomness and imitate the evolutionary process. And this whole uh, re result is passed through an extreme learning machine, which is basically a neural network with a hidden node whose weights are fixed, are frozen. So this way, it's um, trained faster and is more efficient. This was done on three different datasets, on the Mayas, which had uh, 26 rows extracted from it, on the Nijmegen, which had 103 rows extracted from it, and on the DDSM, which had 150 rows extracted from him uh, from it, and these are the results you see of area under curve. In the next uh, uh, example we uh, studied, it's uh, the ResNet 34 architecture, which was not that um, innovative per se because it's relatively old and it's uh, mainly conv convolution layers uh, with a residual connection every third one. But what was really innovative about it and amazed us was the fact that it uh, pitted human against machine and uh, let the machine and the human compete for classification. So in the first regime, they had humans uh, do the classification and they had an AUC of 0 0.81. Then a hybrid regime where the machine created a classification, but the human, uh, after this suggestion, decided ultimately and we had an AUC of 0 0.881. And lastly, when just the machine classified, we had an AUC of 0 0.959. Then we go on to the, our third example, which is a, an ensemble of cascades. And what happens here is that we have a mammogram. This mammogram is passed through a DBLIF network. The DBLIF network is a, a your run of the mill uh, neural network only that it's uh, not trained through a forward and a backward pass. Uh, every it's trained in two layers at once, an input layer and a hidden layer, and then the hidden layer becomes the input layer, and the hid the second hidden layer becomes the hidden layer, and this back and forth goes on in pairs until the whole uh, network is trained. And then this whole data was passed through a Gaussian mixture model where the data is assumed to be simulated by a finite amount of Gaussians with unknown parameters, and the parameters are fitted. After this, uh, it was parsed through a cascade of two region CNNs or RCNNs, which are basic convolu convolutional networks, which have uh, two types of outputs. They output a box, and uh, through that box, a regressor, which uh, this regressor um, refines that box in order to better fit the objects inside of it and an SVM or a support vector machine, which is a classification. The SVM works by taking a, an n-dimensional type of data, which as you can see here, for example, is two-dimensional, orange and blue dots. And in order to classify and separate them, it creates an extra dimension or more if necessary, uh, here a third one, in order to be able for the machine to better the classify them and separate. Then it's passed through uh, two for, two cas a cascade of two random forests, which is basically an ensemble of uh, random of decision trees. Each one uh, outputting a class. There's then there's majority voting, who decides on which class is picked. And then the rows are extracted. These row these bounding boxes on the rows need to be refined, and this is why Bayesian optimization is uh, decided, where you have some data on the boxes. And then we see the major uh, parts of uncertainty uh, about it. And we find the maximum of that uncertainty. And then we take a, a new data acquisition on that point of uncertainty, uh, thus reducing it. And then we will do that iteratively a lot of times to arrive on the final bounding box. Here, this, uh, result, this uh, study was done on the inverse data set of 410 mammograms with a sensitivity of 0 0.96 and a specificity of 0 0.7.
And uh, here we have at last the faster RCNN, a type of region convolutional network again. Here we have a convolution with uh, convolutional network, which is a backbone. Here is the inception version two, and which is passed uh, through afterwards to the region proposal network. The region proposal network is uh, what it actually does is take the image and creates anchors in certain uh, pixels. And on each of these anchors, it applies, um, as you can see, um, boxes, bounding boxes of three different uh, shapes, uh, orthogonals and squares, and of uh, three different sizes. And uh, through training, uh, the sizes which have intersection over union of 0 0.7 or more are considered positive, less than 0 0.3 negative, while the in-between is neglected. This training occurs, and after that, the bounding boxes go again, like every CNN, RCNN, to a regressor to be refined, and to a classifier to decide if the bounding box inside has a, a tumor or not. The backbone here is, the, as I mentioned, the inception version 2 network. It, uh, in this case, let's say you have these pictures of animals and uh, of dogs. Each dog has a different aspect of his uh, presence, uh, his uh, figure presented to us, and uh, different percentage, and he has different stance. Uh, also taking up different space of the picture. In order for a network to decide all this and to find it out, it needs different kernels, different types of convolutions. So what the Inception network does, because it's very difficult to do it in a deep manner, it goes wide. So in its layer, it tries to do that all at the same time. Uh, like in the picture I uh, put in below. However, the version 2 network splits every 5 to 5 convolution network uh, to 2 3 by 3 convolutions. And it's 3 by 3 to a 3 by 1 and then 1 by 3. Here we have two datasets, the OMIDB and the InBreast, while the, where the OMIDB is uh, split into OMIH and OMIDZ. The OMIH part of the dataset was used in every case to first train the network, while in the cases of the OMIDB, uh, the OMIDZ was used for fine tuning, and then the InBreast was used separately for its malign malignant case and for its benign again for fine tuning. So the results here is area under curve of 0 0.85 as 87 for the OMIDB with sensitivity of 0 0.76 and a specificity of 0 0.88. While the inverse, the benign case has a AUC of 0 0.95, sensitivity of 0 0.95 again, specificity of 0 0.7. While uh, we have lower and worse results for the malignant case. Uh, this table surmises all the above. And Thanks for your attention, and I will gladly accept any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dimitris uh, Chatsakis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, now the question, please. I have a first question, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. From point of view of doctor, yeah, <laughs> being a doctor and physiologist, um, yeah. the, the real result for doctors of your proposal, of, of your uh, research, uh, what is the early diagnostic or, uh, or more precise diagnostic? What is the... the... Well, um, this is kind of, in general, computer vision in medicine is kind of a shot in the dark. The aspiration is to do both. Yeah. It's to have better detection, better diagnostics, better and diagnostic. earlier diagnostics. But... Good. Good, thank you, thank you for. So, any question? Please, uh, uh, Dr. Victoria Poscorte, please. Okay, first of all, uh, I will introduce myself. I'm an anesthesiologist, passionate uh, with uh, data science, machine learning, and related fields. I'm working uh, with some applications, and uh, this area is one of the areas of interest, and I'm a little bit Familiar. I would like to thank uh, uh, Dimitris for your uh, very interesting uh, <laughs> uh, uh, report. Uh, yeah. And uh, first of all, uh, about the multitude of techniques, including CNN, including a flat uh, multi-layer perceptron, etc., uh, genetic algorithm. 
uh, etc. And one of the slides uh, over there, uh, probably the, the, the one uh, before you switch to the, the larger version, uh, was, uh, as far as I can recall, about uh, assemblies. And over there, uh, there was uh, such an interesting information concerning uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, sensitivity uh, was quite high for this uh, particular model, uh, something around 96%, uh, while um, uh, specificity was only uh, 70%. Yes, this, this one. Uh, in yeah. this case, uh, there is a risk of false alarm. Uh, mm -hmm. How you uh, solve this issue in uh, a practical uh, environment? Well, uh, I'm not sure exactly, but this specific case, uh, due to the inverse database, the, the inverse database is uh, pretty small. It's 410 mammograms. Okay, so... Uh, maybe this is an issue of the data set. So from uh, an engineering-wise perspective, the first thing that I would do, because I, I have, uh, like, uh, how do you say it? Um, anyway, I, the first thing that I would do was create, uh, use more data sets, more data. And then if that doesn't work, I would see if something else is the problem, maybe an architectural uh, issue with the network or, uh, yeah, but... Mainly, the first thing that I would do is use more data. Find yes, more I, data. I got and I uh, absolutely agree with you. But I'm asking now as a doctor, as yeah. a physician, uh, how uh, would you uh, recommend the physician in case uh, uh, you uh, provide him or her with such a uh, uh, system with uh, uh, this type of, of uh, uh, metrics, uh, performance metrics? Um, how the doctor should should approach such a system? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know exactly how he should approach it. I mean, it's something that is um, relatively now developing. It's not, um, it, it is state of the art, but that doesn't mean that it is deployable or uh, for use in clean kind of environments yet, especially this one. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Let me draw your attention to the fact that the European Commission, through funding the research in the field of environment and health, report the policy of health as safety at work, which leads to the development of tools and methodologies for better risk assessment and design of actions, disease prevention, and health promotion. The inability of the population due to the negative impact of employment and defense activity is the global social and economic problem that proves the need to develop an effective disability prevention program and labor capacities enhancement. Let me give me an example of health fin uh, financing in a developing country like Singapore. The amount close of uh, 7 billion is deeply appreciated. However, the field of health promotion and the research is only a small part. A disability prevention, work and defense capacity enhancement program should begin with the emphasis on individual development at different stages uh, of uh, intrauterine life, based on strengthening of sensory motor, motor integration. Then the program continues in the postnatal uh, post uh, pro period of individual development, taking into account the latest achievement of scientific research. Despite the indisputable strategy of so, such, Mr. Uh, then the program continues in the postnatal period of individual development, taking into account the latest achievement of scientific research. Despite the indisputable strategy of such prevention and enhancement activity, more often is carried out in the presence of complaints and deviation. The most uh, vivid historical theories and practices of developing and uh, correcting skills and abilities in the early stages of development age. In our opinion, the theory of Arnold Giesel and Maria Montessori. This methodology clearly demonstrated the importance of intentional professional intervention in the process of training and development of work and adaptation skills. According,
According to Marie Riley, occupational therapy can be considered the greatest medical idea of the uh, 20th century. Occupational therapy provides assistance to children uh, with disabilities, ensuring their full participants in various uh, social situations to carry out rehabilitation after injuries and support the elderly who experience deterioration in physical and cognitive ability to work. The historical background demonstrates the powerful desire of researchers uh, to fundamentally learn the human labor and defense abilities uh, of, uh, of uh, individual in order to optimize, optimize and improve them. The foundation, the foundation of biomechanics as a science were laid by Italian physiologists, physicians and mathematicians, Giovanni Alfonso Borelli. Giovanni Borelli biochemically substantiated the uh, propositions, propositions that movements of limbs and the body parts of humans and animals when lifting weights, uh, walking, running, swimming, obey the exact laws of physics and are implemented in accordance with the principles of mechanics. Cinematography, uh, cinematography was first used to study human movements by the French physiologist and inventor and uh, photographer Anthony Marion. Namely, Etienne Mori uh, first applied the method of applying markers to various areas of human body, which became the um, prototype of future psychography. A series of photographs Psychography helping course uh, Maybridge showed the whole world the extraordinary beauty of the plastic of the real movement of the animal. The first three dimensional uh, mathematical analysis of human working uh, biomechanics was carried out by Wilhelm Brown and his uh, student Otto Fischer. Hermann von Helmholtz can really, can, uh, rightly be called the father of bioengineering, uh, working at the Faculty of Physical Education and uh, Gymnastics, enable another um, researcher, Etienne Julius Marie, uh, to fundamentally study the patterns of walking and the action of muscle, muscle strength. The man who unsolved the mystery of living motion is uh, Professor Nikolai Alexandrovich Bernstein, founder of modern biomechanics. Well, throughout management, uh, in the modern laboratory of biomechanics, every motor X is fundamentally investigated, its computer model is drawn up, and a mathematical model is calculated. In modern uh, biomedical engineering of lo locomotor activity, the combined study of biomechanics, uh, proprioceptive sensing, sensory motor integration, and virtual reality uh, is fruitful. Simulation uh, two dimensional of horizontal movement of two joint system uh, when the target of flexor of the same shoulder is expressed differently in two different positions. Then, uh, three dimensional of articular, uh, artic articular joints. Example on quantifying proprioception and cinematics, uh, uh, cinematics of movements of tennis player using the example of shoulder and uh, elbow articular joints. Not, not at, the, at the periphery, but the, uh, at the laboratory central levels, the creation of a brain computer interface is one of the most challenge of the biomedical engineering, in particular neuroengineering, which ensure progress not only in medicine, but, but also in the science intensive production. It is important that fluctuation is a degree of arousal resulting in oscillations in the bioelectrical activity of the brain. 
The activation of the cerebral cortex is initiated by special groups of neurons. A lot of neurons contribute to the excitations of areas of the cerebral cortex, including orxinergic neurons that are needed to ensure stable, peri st stable periods of uh, wakefulness and maintain alertness, what is needed to achieve a, motivation, a motivated behavior. The population of uh, acetylcholinergic neurons in uh, basal forebrain from the vertical limb of the broca, uh, diagonal band and from the uh, minerd basal nucleus have diffused projection to all parts of the new neocortex, as well as to the basal lateral tonsils and olfactory bulbs. Uh, acetylcholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain are involved in the mechanism of synaptic neuroplastic remodeling, alertness, learning, memory, arousal, and attention. All these functions are associated with the activation of neurons in cerebral cortex. An idea has been suggested, suggested uh, that cholinergic neurons from basal forebrain participate together with the dopaminergic neurons from ventral tegmental area in the mechanisms of regulation of vigilance, attention, and vital activities during the sleep-wake uh, cycle, during uh, working, working um, uh, career. In, um, well, well thought out management takes in account the importance of highly skilled workers uh, the dependence of the production process uh, process on their activities and therefore organizes programs to promote health and prevent disabilities. And for, unfortunately, modern labor and military services are in the high demand. Thus, the socioeconomic problem of health, uh, um, health loss and the pandemic spread of the non-invasive disease which leads to the disabilities due to occupational activities and has consolidated. The solution of these socioeconomic problems is, is seen in close collaboration between doctors, researchers, and uh, engineers whose, um, whose efforts are aimed at early detection of the first signs of overworking, central and peripheral fatigue, suffering and uh, pathogenesis and reducing labor productivity. Technologies for early detection of central transformation associated with a weakening a sensory motor integration, sensory motor integration, um, both, for the, both for the indication and for their correction are of particular importance uh, uh, during, during over uh, over over uh, effort, exaggerated effort. Uh, these mechanisms, uh, oh, technologies for early detection of central tra tra transformation associated with the weakening of sensory motor integration, both for the indication and for the correction and are of uh, particular importance. Uh, uh, the goal is to carry out a literature, a literature review and to develop a conceptual description of an approach to health forming technologies based on natural ways of influencing the sensory and neuromuscular apparatus, providing an increase in work and defense uh, capacity. Over, over uh, 20 years period, to ensure the fundamentally, fundamentally of our research and the objectivity, uh, objectivity of the discussion uh, of the result obtained, the following collaborative research methods were used. High performance liquid chromatography with the electrochemical detection for the analysis of monoamines uh, uh, and their metabolites in the brain tissue. Histochemical, histochemical and determination of the content of nucleic acid in subcellular compartments of the neurons and their satellite neuroglyocytes 
and immunohistochemical analysis of neurotrophic factors. Experimental hypox hypoxic training in a hypo hypobaric chamber as, uh, was chosen following an experimentally modeled combination of hypoxemia by, with um, uh, hypercapnia uh, by breathing cessation, apnea during sleep, um, simulation of uh, sleep obstructive, uh, obstructive syndrome. This experimental combination makes it possible to test and train the system of general local gas exchange to start energy and plastic metabolism is for, uh, functionally active tissue primarily in the brain. The degree of vigilance at the level of the uh, cerebral cortex areas, um, we applied polysomnographic uh, recordings of oscillations of bioelectrical brain and muscle activity during the uh, 24, uh, 24 hours period of circadian, uh, circadian sleep-wake cycle. We used six electrocorticography channels, one electrocorticography channel, and one electromyography channel, and was accompanied by video uh, surveillance of the active and resting, resting behavior. behavior. Sleep deprivation by, by means of uh, cache rotation, auditory of, uh, or uh, visual stimuli made it possible to stimulate desynchronosis induced by shift work. Uh, thus, uh, thus um, uh, mechanisms of evolutionary, evolutionary adaptation to specific environment were studied using polysomnographic uh, recordings of the uh, and uh, for uh, and uh, for analysis and uh, um, uh, quali qualifying the interhemispheric and intrahemispheric brain asymmetry under conditions of of, of uh, forced desynchronosis. This forced desynchronosis was induced by communica communicative sound signals in white animals and simulated sheep work. Excuse me. Uh, degree by maximizing the EEG channel, EEG awaking was detected and uh, measure it, latency and duration. The severity of behavioral awakening based of, on uh, electromyography recording, uh, bioelectrical severity of, uh, severity of awakening uh, on the level of cerebral cortex was estimated by recording an electrocorticogram desynchronization level. And as a result, we designed uh, one scheme, uh, scheme uh, dependence of arousal, dependence of arousal uh, on uh, intensity, intensity of uh, sensory stimulation, sensory stimulation. It's evident uh, that uh, arousal, arousal um, initiated is initiated on the frontal frontal lobes, prefrontal and frontal lobes, and move it and move it um, to occipital uh, lobes. For uh, estimation, to to estimate. Uh, asymmetry, degree of asymmetry, uh, we um, applied, we applied uh, calculation of uh, cross-correlation, cross-correlation uh, coefficient, uh, coefficient uh, 
and, uh, and as a result, in, in, in the case of uh, uni, uh, unilateral, unilateral sleep in, uh, in the wi uh, wild animal uh, northern forest uh, for, uh, for cell, it's evident uh, that uh, arousal, arousal is realized on the, on the one, one hemisphere. And the uh, correlation, uh, correlation is uh, my evident intra intra hemisphere. This is uh, this is differences in uh, unilateral sleep, uh, left, uh, uh, right, right, and bilateral. Bilateral is evident correlation. Uh, major correlation uh, in uh, parietal uh, lobe. Thus, mechanisms, me mechanisms of evolution and adaptation to specific environment were studied using polysomnographic recordings of the circadian sleep uh, sleep wake cycle, as well as uh, as well as EEG spectral analysis, which makes is possible is possible. To assess the interhemispheric intrahemispheric uh, brain asymmetry under conditions of forced desynchronosis. This forced, forced desynchronosis was induced by a communicative sound science in white animals and simulated shift work. This evolutionary adaptation is characterized by the highest degree of the interhemispheric asymmetry. Unilateral slow, slow wave sleep. Sleep demonstrates neuroplastic and neuroprotective abilities of the brain, preventing neurodegeneration. Forced desynchronosis of the circadian rhythm is expressed by workers and employees who perform their duties around the clock with the shift schedule of production and service uh, activities. Conclusion strategies focused on is the strengthening of the potential of human resources created the foundation for economic innovation and the growth of human capital, which is critical for the conclusion, uh, conclusion of uh, symbiotic agreements and organization of perfect production and as a result, the rise of the national economy. From the educational point of view, training of labor and defense personnel, development of research and development programs, cooperation between educational institutions and large companies, departments are uh, of uh, paramount importance to meet industry and government needs. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Isimopoulos Pilios from the Institute of Biomedical Technology in Greece. And I'm really glad uh, to be participating in this year's ICNBME conference. So today I'm going to present you a project that we undertook uh, regarding the implementation of a medical equipment inventory at the regional healthcare system in Greece, namely the second regional healthcare authority of Piraeus and the Aegean Sea. Now, instead of giving you a strict definition, I would prefer to give you an example case in order to realize the importance of a proper medical device inventory. So, going back a couple of years, we can now definitely say that the pandemic uh, took us by surprise. And uh, in the first few crucial weeks, the only means of prevention that we had available before the development of vaccines and drugs were the medical devices. So uh, we solely depended on them in the first weeks in order to treat uh, the pandemic, in order to limit the disease spreading, in order to earn us some time uh, to help us uh, plan our next steps. Here we can see some examples of medical devices that were mainly used to diagnose or treat the COVID-19 disease. And this includes some consumables like masks, needles, and gloves, but also uh, higher cost or higher technology 
devices like uh, intensive care unit ventilators, non-invasive ventilators, in vitro diagnostics, uh, physiological monitoring systems, pulse oximeters, etc. Okay, so now that we saw the importance of the medical devices in our fight against the pandemic, uh, the question that one might well ask is, okay, we know that the medical devices are important. Now, help me find them. How do I locate them? And this question uh, mainly highlights the electrical uh, devices, which are uh, more costly and uh, much more limited compared to the consumables like masks that uh, were in shortage for a shorter period of time. So, how do I find uh, the ventilator that is missing and is needed in one intensive care unit uh, that might exist somewhere else uh, and be out of use? And the answer to this question, unfortunately, is quite simple, and it is that you don't. And you don't because uh, there is no national medical device inventory existing in Greece, except for some high, very high capital cost equipment like MRIs or CTs. And okay, you may say that uh, that was an extreme case that we highlighted here regarding the pandemic, but uh, the existence, or in our case, the non existence, of uh, medical device inventory uh, may very well hinder uh, the effectiveness, the cost effectiveness, the overall functioning, and uh, lastly, the patient safety in a regional healthcare or even a national healthcare uh, level. And for these reasons, uh, the second regional healthcare authority uh, took the initiative and asked us to create uh, a full uh, medical electrical medical equipment inventory and as you can see here uh, the whole uh, RHA consists of 85 health centers and autonomous multi-purpose regional medical units and uh, thousands more of uh, local healthcare units and uh, that all these span across uh, the Aegean Sea, uh, the Piraeus, and the West Athens sector. And now, uh, even though uh, that to many of you these health centers' names may sound uh, enjoyable uh, because maybe they remind you of your last vacation in Greece, to us uh, these uh, special geographic characteristics were a challenge. And for this reason, uh, a working group of nine experienced biomedical engineers had to be created and a straightforward and uh, well-defined protocol was uh, developed uh, regarding the registration procedure. After that, uh, this whole region was uh, divided into sectors and each biomedical engineer visited uh, every sector uh, where uh, island by island, uh, municipality by municipality, uh, health center by health center, and finally room by room, they, record, they registered uh, every uh, electrical medical device. So now I would like to uh, briefly describe you the registration procedure that we followed for each device, starting of course with the locating of the equipment to be registered. After that, uh, we attached a special indelible in with QR code label bearing a unique uh, code for each, on each device. And then we had to locate the manufacturer's uh, marking label. After that, uh, we took at least three pictures, three photos of each device, one of the Invit uh, QR marking label, one of the uh, manufacturer's marking label, and the last one of the full view of the device. And this data uh, would uh, next be uh, inputted on the Web Praxis Medical Equipment Management System. Also, keep in mind that uh, this whole Procedure was specially designed to minimize time consumed in patient areas, patient discomfort, and uh, distraction of medical, nursing, or administrative staff. And for this reason, uh, a special uh, app was developed, uh, ta uh, tailor suited to the needs of uh, this registration procedure. 
And now, having followed the, the procedure uh, described previously for each device, we were able to obtain the following information for each uh, device. And this information includes, of course, the unique device code on the QR label, the manufacturer of the device, the model, uh, its serial number and medical device group, the room of installation, uh, its date of manufacture, and sometimes we would uh, be able to indirectly obtain information like uh, the acquisition method if it's purchase, donation, uh, the date of acquisition, and the operational status. And this information would be obtained mainly uh, with the help of the local staff. At this point, it was also clarified to the local staff who would uh, be called to repeat uh, this uh, registration procedure in the future by themselves, uh, the types of equipment to be registered, and that includes uh, electrical medical devices that are most likely to be in need of repairs or periodic uh, maintenance uh, in the future, like defibrillators, suction pumps, or X-ray imaging systems, and the equipment to be excluded are capital equipment, uh, small battery-powered devices, or consumables. And then uh, the last step of the registration procedure, as we saw earlier, uh, was the data entry on the Web Praxis Medical Equipment Management System. And although uh, this uh, integration is not uh, a prerequisite for the existence of an inventory. Uh, it is the only way to unlock its full potential. And speaking of data entry, uh, one of its most uh, challenging and time consuming parts was that of uh, the categorizing of the devices into medical device groups. For this reason, we used uh, the GMGN uh, nomenclature system with some uh, examples shown here on the left. And uh, although it can be a very tedious uh, procedure uh, due to the fact mostly because it is not a straightforward decision uh, to which a group you have to appoint each device due to lack of information most of the times, uh, it is very important if we have if we want to speak a common language when discussing about uh, the devices and in order to uh, create some technical specifications and prepare for future procurements. One of the final challenges that we had to face was how to ensure that uh, the inventory and the whole system would be kept alive. And this is a challenge because uh, this includes uh, many different users with different backgrounds from different geographical locations. Uh, it is known that uh, various uh, approaches from the year 2000 and so on have failed, uh, mainly because uh, the inventories went out of date. So in order to overcome such a setback, we implemented a complete a full user training program in various uh, phases. The first phase was uh, during the live demonstration during uh, the on-site visits, where the local staff was uh, given um, most of the procedures that had to be followed for the inventory process. Then a series of training and technical support webinars were held for both uh, the decentralized users in each uh, health center, as well as the centralized technical authorities. Also, a special education web practice website was created with a portion of the uh, real complete registered data. And finally, uh, an asynchronous education platform was used uh, with a tutorial course covering uh, most of all uh, the full web practice procedures. Now, the results of the registration was that. 85 health units were uh, registered. The creation of an electronic inventory was uh, performed. These data were fed to uh, MMs and access was given to all hospitals and health centers. 
and some numbers show that uh, over 4,500 devices were registered of about 640 manufacturers uh, belonging to 1,600 models and over categorized over uh, 280 medical device groups. But most importantly, if we go back to the question on the example at the start of this uh, presentation, it is now that not only we know how many devices of, how, of which uh, medical device group there exist, but we also know their exact position. And this is maybe a less simple but more fulfilling answer to the question that we uh, imposed on the start. And aside from that, a collection of over 1,700 photos of the existing equipment was created, uh, with each set of photos, as the one shown here, uh, being linked with uh, its corresponding device and making uh, its identification uh, easier in the future. And finally, some uh, interesting statistics regarding the operational status of the devices were obtained. And as you can see here, a very big portion of the equipment, about one quarter of it, it's not being used. Uh, it's out of use for many reasons. Either it's out of order or it is stored or it is waiting to be withdrawn. Moreover, uh, here on the right, you can see uh, the distribution of the number of medical devices on each health center. And this uh, well depicts the inhomogeneity of uh, the situation in the second uh, regional health care authority uh, due to the different needs and population coverage of each uh, health center in this on by the very variable number of devices here. But most interestingly, there are many cases highlighted here where uh, a very big ratio of their equipment uh, is out of use. And now that this is known, uh, it is easy to perform a redistribution of uh, this equipment to uh, other health centers where it's needed. And as a last note here, uh, the medical inventory is but a small part of uh, medical device MEMS, like the web praxis, uh, which has modules facilitating for report repairs or device maintenance procedures with uh, easy and straightforward uh, procedures and actions that facilitate the everyday routine of the staff and help them, of course, uh, focus on the most important part of their job, which is uh, the patient. All in all, we can say that uh, correct and updated inventory is the basis for the proper management of medical equipment because as we saw earlier first of all we can have a clear and immediate view of the equipment then having this knowledge we can perform a strategic planning of future purchases or donations and only acquire what is truly needed then having existing trustworthy data we can perform uh, evidence-based management uh, regarding the needs uh, of the equipment redistribution uh, inside the region. Uh, of course, taking into consideration the equipment condition, number, cost of use, and overall perform a requirement analysis. And last but not least, uh, the vigilance is an important part and it can be uh, developed only with a proper inventory that allows us to immediately detect uh, faulty equipment and proper uh, report an adverse uh, event that may occur. So uh, thank you very much for your attention in this project that constitutes a pilot application of best practice in medical equipment inventorying in Greece. And uh, we believe it will help improve very many performance indices uh, of the medical equipment uh, in use, and we hope that uh, could be an example for the implementation of such uh, systems throughout the country in the future. Again, thank you very much.
Today, I will present to you my uh, literature review, the impact of positive blood alcohol content on outcomes of trauma patients. Uh, first of all, uh, alcohol is known to be a psychoactive substance, a central nervous system depressant, that has highly dependent properties. Nowadays, alcohol beverages are one of the most consumed products daily. Some people consume for recreational purposes at the gatherings or parties, while uh, others are dependent on it. Unfortunately, uh, the range of people who consume alcohol is very vast, from teenagers to older adults. More than that, social networks like uh, Facebook, like Instagram, like a lot, applauded the pictures with uh, alcoholic beverages. And advertisements have a strong influence to encourage the consumption of alcohol. Uh, over time, serious health problems can occur due to alcohol. In this context, it is very easy to discount uh, that uh, the health and social damage caused by alcohol or contributed to by drinking. In uh, uh, 2019, the worldwide total consumption was equal to six liters, six liters of pure alcohol per person of uh, 15 years and older. But unrecorded consumption accounts more than 26% of worldwide total consumption. Actually, in the Republic of Moldova, Alcohol consumption was equal with 28.4 liters of pure alcohol per person 15 years and older. Distributing by genders is approximately uh, 38 liters of pure alcohol for males and uh, 13 liters of pure alcohol for females. Also, dates from 2000, uh, 2016 report the prevalence of alcohol use disorders than that affect 10% of males and 2% of females. Uh, about alcohol dependence, suffering near 5% uh, of males and 1% of females. Actually, alcohol is the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States after the tobacco and poor diet. Also, uh, also uh, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and the Police from the United States describes the real situation about alcohol-related deaths, where more than 68,000 men and 27,000 women died because of drinking under alcohol influence. In Europe, about 800 adults die from alcohol every day. And finally, in Moldova, 26% of the deaths are caused directly or indirectly by alcohol consumption. Actually, alcohol consumption contributes annually to 3 million deaths and leads to poor health outcomes and disabilities. Alcohol is a leading risk factor for premature mortality and disability. Um, accounting for 10% of all deaths in this group, like 15 years to 49 years. Low-income countries have higher rates of alcohol-related deaths and hospitalization. Also, Also, um, everything is okay? Can I continue? Yes, yes, you can continue. Oh, yeah. Because I uh, heard some sounds. Okay, like, like I discussed about the health problems, you can see here a lot of health problems caused by alcohol. And uh, I'll count just some of this one, like uh, liver disease, 
because the alcohol is mostly metabolized in the liver, which uh, is why the liver is particularly at risk of damage. The body actually metabolized alcohol into acetaldehyde, uh, a substance that uh, is both toxic and um, can lead to cancer. Alcoholic uh, liver disease is influenced by the amount and duration of alcohol abuse. Also chronic heavy drinkers says it's a substantial risk for its development. Other effects on uh, the liver include long-term inflammation, that it's also known like hepatitis, and also can cause cirrhosis. Pancreatitis, why? Overconsumption of uh, alcohol can lead to pancreatitis, a painful inflammation of the pancreas that often requires hospitalization. The inflammation is likely related to premature activation of proenzymes, to pancreatic enzymes, and chronic exposure to acetaldehyde and other chemical activities in the pancreas caused by alcohol injury. Around 70% of cases of pancreatitis affect people who regularly drink large amounts of alcohol. Cancer. Uh, chronic alcohol consumption can increase the risk of developing different cancers, including cancers of the mouth, esophagus, larynx, stomach, etc. Uh, also, people who smoke tobacco as well as drinking have a higher risk of cancer of the upper gastrointestinal respiratory tract. Brain damage. Actually, alcohol is associated with uh, blurred vision, memory lapses, slurred speech, difficulty of walking, uh, slow direction time. These are, due, these are all due to its effect on the brain. It alters the brain receptors and neurotransmitters and it interferes with person's cognitive function modes, emotion, and the reaction on multiple levels. Because uh, alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, uh, it causes difficulty with processing information and poses challenges, challenges with solving simple problems. Alcohol's effect on serotonin and GABA receptors may cause neurological changes that could lead to a reduction in a person's normal fear of consequence to their own actions, contributing to risk-taking or violent behaviors. Uh, accident and injuries. Drinking alcohol is uh, any amount, in any amount is linked to car crashes, domestic violence, falls, drowning, occupational uh, injuries, uh, suicide, etc. Driving ability may be impaired with uh, as little as one drink, and person who drinks heavily is likely to sustain a greater severity of injury with an accident. And uh, no pattern of drinking is entirely risk-free. And there is no reliable method of predicting how or when an individual will be harmed as a result of chronic having heavy drinking of alcohol. Actually, there is no doubt that alcohol consumption can increase the traumatic frequency, being an important factor uh, that affects the trauma evolution. Also, acute or chronic alcohol consumption contributes to, increase, uh, to uh, incidence of traumatic brain injury. However, more than 30 years of research on the impact of alcohol on the neuroanatomical and functional outcomes of traumatic brain injury have produced ambiguous results. Driving under the influence of alcohol increased the risk of fatal and not fatal driving accidents. A possible, uh, possible explanation for this is that the intoxicated driver, drivers usually take more risk and drive 
faster, powerful. They are also my, uh, more likely to suffer serious injury or death compared with sober drivers. Polytrauma was defined as cases with uh, an abbreviated injury scale more than three points for two or more different body regions and one or more additional variables. I can see hypertension, unconsciousness, acidosis, uh, coagulopathy, and age. Actually, abbreviated injury scale, you can observe here, uh, represents an anatomical score that appreciates by a scale then varies from one to six, the severity of uh, trauma in a topographical region of a body by the following uh, model one mirror mirror minor uh, um, score two moderate three serious four severe five critical and six fatal uh, also the topographical regions considered in this score are head neck face thorax abdomen limbs uh, and um, now um, the um, association between alcohol intoxication and the injury severity, mortality, and uh, length of stay in the hospital is, uh, however, inconsistent in the literature. Indeed, the majority of studies have found no difference in mortality and length uh, of uh, a hospital of stay between uh, back positive and back negative patients. Some study, uh, studies uh, have reported a higher mortality rate and a longer length of hospital stay among through the back positive trauma patient. This uh, systematic uh, review actually used the uh, four electronic uh, database like uh, Med uh, Medline Research for Life and Med Science uh, Direct were searched from uh, 2015 to 2022 using a search strategy. This search strategy included a combination of medical subject headings like uh, keywords uh, like trauma, polytrauma, injury, alcohol, ethanol positive, blood alcohol level, and very important, out. Chosen uh, studies for uh, analysis met the following conclusion criteria. First of all, study, the design of this study, the original data involving it from, uh, participants, the population, uh, trauma patients admitted to a hospital or trauma centers, and exposure to patients with a positive blood alcohol concentration. Actually, uh, uh, Total of uh, 17 studies met all of the inclusion criteria. Uh, like, uh, like I said, uh, the studies were published between 2015 and 2021, uh, and was performed in uh, United States, Europe, Asia, Australia, etc. Studies uh, were performed. Uh, both at a single center and also involved major adult trauma centers. In uh, total, we included uh, more than uh, more than fifty uh, thousand patients. Also, studies vary about the level of uh, back blood alcohol content. Uh, there were, are differences between the time of admission after injury. The most common uh, methods to determine alcohol uses uh, were measurement of back uh, levels and the evidence from medical records. In um, uh, 216, in a cross-sectional study from Taiwan, designed to investigate the effect of alcohol intoxication, uh, one uh, uh, intoxication uh, on the clinical presentation of uh, more than 900 hospitalized adult trauma patients, and to measure their outcome, uh, Shuhui Peng uh, concluded that 
the patients with alcohol intoxication presented with significant higher short-term mortality. In another study, uh, Nassim Ahmed in 2020 concluded that the patient who tested with back positive above the legal limit sustained a higher injury severity score and also higher inter-hospital mortality compared with patients who tested negative. Uh, Wong from uh, in 2021, um, after publishing a retrospective study where the bug positive were considered values of alcohol more than two, uh, more than uh, 10 uh, milligrams per deciliter, related that the patients in the alcohol positive group had higher mortality rate, higher clotting time, and lower maximum lysis, more fibrinolysis shutdown, and hyperfibrinolysis than those in, go in uh, the alcohol negative group. Um, in 2018, in a retrospective uh, cohort study on individuals treated for isolated trauma brain injury with 282 patients back positive and 802 patients back negative, observed that positive blood alcohol was associated with decreased risk of mortality among individuals with penetrating injuries. Uh, in another study, um, also performed in, uh, published in uh, 2021, found that uh, alcohol intoxication in hospital, uh, hospitalized major trauma patient is independently associated with decreased injury severity and mortality in patients with trauma brain injury. Um, in 2020, also in a, into a retrospective study, concluded that uh, one year mortality was lower among patients with back positive. Majid Afshar uh, in a historical cohort of uh, um, uh, more than uh, uh, 50,000 admission to the trauma center found that more than uh, 14,000 patients with back positive. Um, also, also Afshar uh, divided the uh, quantity of alcohol or uh, alcohol uh, uh, presence in the blood, like moderate, from uh, one to 100 milligram per deciliter, high concentration, from 101 to uh, 230 milligram per deciliter, and very high, from more than 200 milligram per deciliter. And this is why I did this <laughs> this subject because very interesting. The outcome corresponds with a U-shaped curve, which means that moderate back increase mortality and very high back blood alcohol content decrease mortality. Alcohol exposure by back groups was associated with both injury and in hospital deaths in an inverse U-shaped distribution. Another study from Germany, published in 2021, related no difference between back positive and back negative groups. Actually, the goal of this uh, systematic review was to examine the outcome of patients with trauma and blood alcohol content positive. Some studies concluding, uh, concluded that uh, they are better outcome for back positive patients, while other studies suggest an opposite opinion. 
it seems that data is more informative for traumatic brain injury, where most studies related to a better outcome for a trauma patient with back OSD. Different back groups are associated with very different types of injury, and back needs to be more studied to be considered the only predictive or individual factor, factor or for outcome. Um, like uh, like uh, conclusion, it's uh, there. There are no concluded data to consider alcohol as a protective factor. Also, there are no concluded data to consider alcohol as worsening factor for outcome or for intrahospital mortality. And in the Republic of Moldova, there are no data to consider alcohol as protective or worsening factor for trauma patients. And uh, like, like Nota Bene, the Paracelsus says that all things are poison and nothing is without, without poison. Only the dose makes that a thing is no poison. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Koretsky. Uh, that was uh, uh, really interesting, uh, mostly because it was counterintuitive for many of us to believe that uh, back positive or back negative uh, may have no effect, as it seems, on mortality. Uh, so, are there any questions? If there are no questions, I would like to ask you personally if you believe that in the future we may have a definitive answer to this question if regarding alcohol and uh, uh, resulting mortalities. Actually, actually, we want to study this subject and uh, to perform a score, a score that include the alcohol like like individual factor. And uh, we suppose that alcohol can influence the outcome of patients, but with another factors, with another factors. Like, like we want to, to make a, a national score, like it's a trauma score for, or abbreviated scale injury or another scales for traumatic patients. Uh, we suppose that we can do a specific score for Republic of Moldova, including alcohol in this score. I am Marta Dobert. I would like to present the results of our study. Um, Non-invasive non monitoring of pulse rate and desaturation events with ox matter in um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in a rest patient with cardiovascular comorbidities. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a respiratory condition characterized by persistent air limitation, air flow limitation. COPD is characterized by an abnormal inflammatory response of the lung venosis particle or, or gaze. The global prevalence of COPD is approximately 11.77% and COPD is estimated to become the fourth leading cause of death worldwide by 2030. COPD is a complex pathology with a well-defined pulmonary complement, but also with multiple extrapulmonary manifestations and important comorbidity which can emphasize the severity of the disease. 
individual exacerbation and comorbidity de determine the evolution of the disease. The iron being associated with systemic disease, heart failure, cardiac arrhythmia, as and sudden death. It is increasingly recognized that comorbidity are, are well highly prevalent irrespective of severity of COPD. This comorbidity contributes to the severity of symptoms and progression of the disease. Cardiovascular diseases, including hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, stroke, and peripheral arterial disease are the most common comorbidity in COPD with the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in patients with COPD range from 13 to 68 percent. Pulse oximetry is routinely used to non-invasively monitor oxygen saturation level. A low, a low oxygen level in the blood means low oxygen in the, in the tissues, which can ultimately lead to organ, organ failure. In the identification of the oxygen desaturation can support the diagnosis, diagnosis and continuous monitor of, monitoring of patient pulmonary function to predict prognosis. Specifically, uh, studying the variability of the oxygen saturation may, may provide information on the underlying uh, physiological control system. And furthermore, and may enhance uh, our understanding of the manifestation and etiology of disease and identity desaturation of the purpose of, um, of health monitoring. The repetitive nocturnal hypoxemia may cause oxidative stress, contributing contributing to the pathogen, uh, pathogenesis of cardiovascular morbidity. Similarly, patients with advanced chronic obstructive, advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease commonly exhibit uh, overnight hypoxia. In this respect, non-invasive monitoring of pulse rate and desaturation events with oximeter in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, patients with cardiovascular comorbidities in order to optimize the exacerbation diagnosis, predict the development of the complication and therapeutic approach. The aim of, uh, of the study was non-invasive monitoring of food of pulse rate and desaturation events with oximeter in COPD patients with cardiovascular comorbidity. The clinical study was con uh, conducted on a gr group of uh, 101 patients with uh, COPD Gold 1 uh, for uh, hospitalized for exacerbation in municipal hospital colony dignity. The patients including, included in the study were aged between 45, 44, and, and 78 years, and um, whom uh, 55 were femme, uh, and uh, 46 were men. According to the gold 2016 guard, the clinical di diagnosis of the COPD was based on, um, on spirometry confirming a ration of uh, post-bronchodilator forced expiratory volume in one second and for, uh, forced vital uh, capacity below uh, 0. Uh, uh, 70. The severity of COPD can be graded according to the degree of air flow limitation into mm, mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. The current level of patient symptoms 
and their risk of exacerbation for cl classifying COPD patients. Goal A, low risk, fewer symptoms. Goal B, low risk, more symptoms. Goal C, high risk, fewer symptoms. Goal D, more, uh, goal D, high risk, more symptoms. It was determined uh, determine the existence of associations between type uh, A, B, C, D of COPD and the uh, presence of uh, cardiovascular comorbidities. All patients with COPD were told to monitor blood pressure, uh, heart rate, body temperature, respiratory rate, and electrocardiogram, heart rate disturbance. Blood pressure monitoring was necessary at the beginning of treatment and was carried out regularly every five minutes until effective doses of vasodilator, vasodilator diuretic, and or inotropic drugs were selected. Pulse, pulse rate and the saturation events were identified and recorded with the oximeter data manager. The saturation event was identified and recorded when saturation dropping was over uh, 4% for at least 10 seconds. Pulse rate event was, was identified and recorded when pulse rate change was over uh, 6 bits per minute for at least um, 8 seconds. In less severe patient during oxygen therapy, regular pulse oximetry every hour was performed. According to the diagnosis, diagnosis pyrometric criteria of um, COPD gold 2016, in the study group, um, group prevalent, um, prevalent the patient with gold three and gold four. Severity of the bronchial obstruction. By corroboration in the anamnestic clinic and paraclinic data, it was established the presence of the risk factor on and all the CVC in the study group, namely smoking, chronic skin heart disease, arterial hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and obesity. A large number uh, of patients had uh, um, high body mass index values, respectively. 45 overweight, uh, 80 uh, first degree obesity, 10 second degree obesity, and uh, seven patients had first degree obesity. The smokers in the study were 42 patients, the majority of the male, 39 women, women only three, the ex-smokers were 15. Type 2 diabetes mellitus was also frequently encountered in the group of patients studied by us in 29. The pre presence of cardiovascular disease in the evaluation by a patient of uh, 58%. The analysis of the presence of cardiovascular comorbidity according to type A, B, C, D of uh, COPD show a predominance of the rate of cardiovascular comorbidity in type, type D compared to C, B, and Y. Significant statistical correlation between the degree of limitation of air flow in, in the airway in patients with COPD and the frequency of CVC were not relevant. Patients with the coexistence of COPD and CVC were older compared to patients with cardiovascular disease. Hypertension was diagnosed in 39 patients 59 patients, uh, out of which were with stage 2 predominant 
um, compared to stage three of COPD. Ischemic heart disease was present in 45 cases and um, is six, six of them in an anamnestic was detect old myocardial infarction. Electrocardiography conduction disorder were found in 42 patients from, patient from the study group, of which more prevented his right battle block compared to the left one. Supraventricular tachycardia in six, atrial fibrillation in 16, without difference by sex. Symptoms and signal of chronic heart failure was relevant in 69. Non-invasive monitoring of pulse rate and desaturation event with oximeter was carried out constantly in 91. When saturation events were identified and 36 and stable patient received oxygen therapy with a concentration of oxygen in the inhaler air, both rate events in 67. Acute heart failure with significant dyspnea and hemodynamic instability associated with acute corona syndrome was diagnosed in five cases and the initial car was proved in intensive car unit. From them, three patients with moderate, moderate, moderate acute heart failure present with the scene and symptom of hypoperfusion. Use of accessory muscle, um, muscle for breathing respiratory rate more than 25 per minute, heart rate more uh, 100. Uh, 30 uh, bit per minute, um, systolic good blood pressure um, less 90, showed modest uh, reduction in oxygen saturation, whereas in two patients with severe heart failure had severe oxygen desaturation, even in rest, at rest the immediate resuscitation Support and intubation was uh, applied. Understand the association of the two entities, COPD and uh, CVC can allow and provide the prediction of cardiovascular risk in patients with COPD by identified people and higher risk of mortality and CVC. Uh, morbidity and CVC mortality. The recent study by Grid Research Pillars um, established that the episode of exacerbation in COPD is a minor mortality factor in the case of CVC, especially during and mid immediately after exacerbation. The CLIP cohort study, the uh, results of whom were published by Collard Mullerova and her colleagues in the wiki show that the preview episode of exacerbation of COPD is a risk factor for new exacerbation. According to European uh, guidelines, non-invasive ventilation is used commonly in uh, COPD patients with cardiovascular comorbidity but invasive Ventilation is required in only a minority of patients. Systolic blood pressure, heart rhythm and rate, saturation of peripheral, peripheral oxygen, use a pulse oximeter and urine output should be monitored on a regular and fragrant basic until the patient is stable. Oxygen may be given to treat hypoxemia, which is associated with increasing risk of short-term mortality. Oxygen 
shall not be used routinely in non hypoxic fashion as it causes constriction and a reduction in cardiac output. Oxygen therapy is recommended uh, in patients with acute heart failure and 25 breathing um, per minute and saturation less 90% uh, to correct hypoxemia. In COPD, hyperoxygenation may increase ventilation perfusion, mismatch, suppress ventilation, and lead to hypercap. During oxygen therapy, acid ba bus balance and uh, saturation should be monitored. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is continuous positive airway pressure and pressure support improve respiratory failure, increases oxygen nation and uh, pH and decrease the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and work of breathing. Non-invasive uh, positive pressure pressure ventilation should be started as soon as possible in patients with respiratory distress, respiratory rate, more 25 breathing per minute and saturation less 20 percent. Um, to improve gas exchange and reduce the rate of endotracheal intubation. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation includes both CPAP and B-level positive pressure ventilation. B-level um, positive pressure ventilation also uh, allows inspiratory pressure support that improve minute ventilation and is especially useful in patients with hypercapnia, most topical COPD patients. Conge congestion effect, lung function increase in intrapulmonary shortening, resulting in hypoxia. The fractional in spirit oxygen should be increased to um, 100 if necessary according to oxygen satura uh, saturation level. Blood pressure should be monitored regularly during non invasive non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. The increase, increase in tra, intrathoracic pressure with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation de, decreases venule return and right and left ventricular preload. It may also decrease cardiac output and um, blood pressure and should be required be used with caution, yeah, caution in patients with reduced preload reserve and hypotension. The increase in pulmonary vascular uh, resistance and um, uh, right ventricular af after long may also be de detrimental in right ventricle dysfunction. Intubation is recommended for progressive respiratory failure in spite of oxygen administration or non-invasive ventilation. In conclusion, the presence of cardiovascular, cardiovascular comorbidity in patient hospitals with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease exacerbation is high and associated with re-hospitalization and death. Pulse Oximetry is useful for non-invasive monitoring of hypoxemia present and the severity of the patient response to supplement oxygen and over therapy, especially in emergency situation in exacerbated uh, COPD and cardiovascular comorbidity. Thank you for your attention. O să vă prezint astăzi un studiu clinic prospectiv controlat despre eficiența ozonoterapiei ca și terapie complementară în tratamentul 
pacienților cu COVID-19 și anume în departamentul de terapie intensivă. Și să vă recunosc din start că a fost un proiect îndrăzneț pentru noi, pentru că la ziua de astăzi nu există în literatura mondială proiecte sau proiecte mari sau studii mari, trealuri mari pe pacienții în terapie intensivă de o zonoterapie. Nu am nimic de declarat, niciun conflict de interese. Câte ceva din actualitate, deci dezvoltarea vertiginoasă a pandemiei cu virusul SARS-CoV-2, cu un rezultat mare de cazuri și cifrele vorbesc de la sine, justifică necesitatea explorării și dezvoltării în regim de alertă a unor protocoale terapeutice, identificarea unor metode eficiente de profilaxie realizate prin tratament patogenic. Practic, zilnic asistăm la un tumult informațional în vederea completării terapiei standarde aplicate. Recomandările clinice, tratamentele precedente și actuale au fost recomandate fie empiric, fie în baza unui număr restrâns de cazuri înrolate, cu metodologii de cercetare precară, referitor la managementul pacientului infectat. De multe ori aceste terapii ne-au lăsat uh, desamăgiți, să-i zic așa, terapii care au apărut de la începutul, uh, uh, de la începutul acestei pandemii, dar care au mers mai departe și ne -au, nu ne-au lăsat să așteptăm, să sperăm la rezultate mai bune. Având în vedere numărul tot mai mare de pacienți infectați, este necesară o abordare cât mai eficientă a măsurilor de terapie complementară, care necesită a fi reorganizate în absența unor terapii off-label. În acest sens, ozonul medical poate fi o opțiune validă prin exercitarea acțiunilor sale antivirale și contrastarea disfuncțiilor endoteliale. Acele disfuncții care sunt veriga patogenetică centrală în, virusul, în infecția cu virusul SARS-CoV-2 și modulând astfel răspunsul imun. Până în prezent, nu a fost efectuat niciun studiu prospectiv controlat privind influența ozonoterapiei asupra pacienților cu SARS-CoV-2 în unitățile de terapie intensivă. În acest slide, deci, am expus experiența prepandemică care a demonstrat utilitatea ozonoterapiei, care a demonstrat și a demonstrat utilitatea sa de fapt prin scăderea inflamației cu ameliorarea proceselor oxidative tisulare, rezultate cu o regenerare mult prea bătită, reducerea hipoxiei tisulare, scăderea hipercoagulabilității, ameliorarea funcției fagocitare, inhibarea tuturor cascadelor inflamatorii. Efectele benefice ale ozonului utilizat de mai mult de un secol au servit de premize de cercetări substanțiale a potențialilor mecanisme ale amestecului de O2-O3 în lupta cu virusul SARS-CoV-2. În acest slide, deci am reflectat imaginea de acele potențiale mecanisme nemijlocite prin care ozonul își exercită funcția în infecția cu virusul ucigaș. Deci este preluată dintr-un articol apărut recent în, a, în octombrie 2021, aici aveți sursa din unde poate fi găsit. Deci este toată patogenia virusului. Și găsim ilustrate frumos toate mecanismele sau acele proprietăți ale ozonoterapiei care pot fi preluate. Deci, în primul rând, se enumeră mecanismul sau proprietatea ozonului și anume cea antivirală. O acțiune nemijlocită asupra capsidei virale cu peroxidarea acesteia și inactivarea virală. La fel, își va exercita rolul și asupra areneului viral cu, de, cu denaturarea acestuia, astfel și replicarea virală de mai departe, efectiv nu va avea loc. Un mecanism virus static, 
va rezulta și din modularea factorului eritroid, care va bloca proteina spike, lăsând receptorul ACE2 col, chiar efectiv fuziunea de celulă gazdă nu va mai avea loc. Stimularea metabolismului de oxigen, în acest parametru este valorificat acțiunea antioxidantă tenace a ozonului cu oxidarea citocromului P450 și eliminarea tuturor radicalilor lipe. Proprietatea imunomodulatoare prinde contur accentuat în ultima perioadă și se exprimă prin acțiunea ozonului asupra creșterii producției de interferon, factorul de necroză tumorală, dar mai ales asupra interleuchinei 2, cu rol cheie în cascada de reacții imunologice și blocarea furtunii citochinice. În imaginea dată, de asemenea, observăm un efect nemijlocit asupra plămânului, mai exact asupra alveolei pulmonare, care se rezumă la creșterea rezistenței medii și specifice în căile respiratorii, cu reducerea semnificativă a presiunii transpulmonare. Astfel, vom obține a creșterii cu creșterea indexului respirator, cu majorarea aportului de oxigen spre membrana alveolă capilară, precum și atenuarea leziunilor pulmonare ce neapărat vor surveni. Un alt efect nu mai puțin uh, esențial este cel antitrombotic cu sinteza oxidului nitric și eliberarea din abundența a prostaciclinilor sub acțiunea ozonoterapiei. Deci, cum vă spuneam mai sus, am efectuat un uh, studiu controlat prospectiv randomizat într-un uh, Unicentru, compus din 100 de pacienți internați în unitatea de terapie intensivă, divizat în două grupuri. Grupul supus terapiei cu ozon și grupul de control. Ei au fost divizați aleator, absolut aleator, și au construit câte 50 de pacienți în fiecare grup. Din Prioritățile observate, deci ce ne-am pus noi ca scop, au fost, sau toate cele efecte ale ozonului care au fost enumerate, au putut influența, deci rata de mortalitate, cel mai important au cam a fost mortalitatea cu siguranță, dar nu mai puțin importante au fost și Durata sejurului în terapie intensivă și spital ca și aspect economic, durata ventilației neinvazive, durata ventilației mecanice, profilul inflamator și profilul oxigenet. Iar efectul ozonoterapiei a fost estimat printr-o analiză multivariată. În imagine avem aparatul propriu zis de ozonoterapie care și procedura la patul pacientului schematic din cum ea se va efectua, deci se extrage 120-150 de ml de sânge pe un substrat de anticoagulant și tratul de sodiu, se ozonează și se reintroduce înapoi. Toate modelele de tratament au la bază protocoalele de lucru stabilite în cadrul declarației de la Madrid, care stabilește principiile de bază ale terapiei cu ozon, iar acestea sunt incluse în softul generatorului de ozon, care îl avem în imagine. Din rezultate, deci chiar dacă observăm o diferență procentuală, în cele două grupe de pacienți, în grupul supus a zonoterapiei și cel control, indicatorii după analiza multivariată cu testul hipotrat de 0,4, semnificația P de 0,5 și OTS ratio cu intervale destul de largi, nu s-a înregistrat nicio divergență în indicatorii statistici. Analiza multivariată a duratei ventilației non-invazive cu mediana în locul de control versus locul cu ozonoterapie care a fost cu aceeași, chiar dacă mediana interquartil range în primul caz este 4 și al doilea este 7, 
de asemenea nu determină semnificații relevante. Ca de altfel și ceilalți indicatori a semnificației statistice. În cazul duratei ventilației mecanice, indicatorii semnificației statistice la fel nu înregistrează diferențe. Raționamentul utilizării ozonoterapiei ca tratament al șofan necesită unele protocoale complet definite și standardizate prin prisma studiilor clinice care cu siguranță vor mai apărea. Vă mulțumesc enorm pentru atenție și mulțumesc Comitetului de Organizare pentru ocazia oferită de a-mi prezenta rezultatele obținute. Ok, mulțumesc foarte mult.